This is the story of Boku. Boku was born in the realm of Karatur, the youngest of three brothers. His name meant the polite one. His brothers were the shocking one and the brute. Their monk training began at a young age. By the time of his puberty, the shocking one had mastered the elements, and the brute had mastered the way of the open hand. In their travels, they came upon a desperate village. The men were wounded or dead, the children crying at the loss of their fathers, and the women were all heartbroken. They knew they had found the victims of their nemesis, Jack Burton, a mighty fighter who drove a giant wagon with many horses known as the Pork Chop Express. Tracking him down, they faced him one at a time. The shocking one faced him first. Being a Four Elements monk, he was quickly cut in twain. The brute faced him next. Being a monk who focused on strength, well, you can imagine how that went. Jack Burton fought without honor, and two family members were struck down. But the polite one was wise. He fled and sought out the help of the oracle on the mountain, who said, What's wrong with you? Don't face him one at a time. The polite one responded, But my brothers are dead. The oracle said, Heal the commoners of the village. They'll be more help to you than the poorly made monk builds that were your brothers. Boku did as the oracle suggested. He led the villagers against their enemy. Boku shouted his challenge. You killed my brothers, and for that, Jack Burton, you shall have no mercy. Jack Burton did not seem impressed. Just remember what old Jack Burton does when the earth quakes and the poison arrows fall from the sky and the pillars of heaven shake. Yeah, Jack Burton just looks at that big old storm right square in the eye and he says, Give me your best shot, pal. I can take it. Turns out he couldn't, and Boku defeated that villainous wagon driver, and the village was saved. The village elders spoke to Boku. You, Boku, the polite one, you shall forever bear our thanks and the name of our village. Do you know who you are, polite one? He responded. Well, I guess that makes me Mercy Boku. Thank you very much. If you'd like to support the content on this channel, consider checking out the link for my Patreon in the video description. Patrons of this channel get to see these videos early, basically as soon as I'm done them, and without monetization. And top level patrons can join me and play some D&D every month. Today I want to recognize these top level patrons. Scott Dunnington, Scott J. Smith, Sig, Stephen Edmondson, T.U.M., Tazel, Thomas Barrero, Thomas Van Lersel, Tristan, and Tristan Bello. Thank you all so much for your support. Let's get started. So here is the beginning of our Mercy Monk. We do not need any setting specific stuff. This is a character that is using pretty standard rules, so it should be available in pretty much any campaign. The one thing is we do need to access both Tasha's Customize Your Origin so that we can alter some ability scores and optional class features because we want those extra class features with the monk. I mean, especially with the monk. Now, when it comes to race, uh, usually when I do an optimized build, the first thing I think is, is there any reason why I wouldn't go variant human or custom lineage? Because those two races tend to be the best races for pretty much anything you do. This is actually one of those rare exceptions where I don't think they're the best choice. And there's a couple reasons for that, and I'm going to get into the numbers a little bit later, but essentially I just don't think they offer much at all here. Uh, I think we're way better suited picking a race that gets weapon training and gets ability score increases in three different ability scores. Because with a monk, we just we can't afford to start out with a constitution of less than 16, I don't think because we're going into melee, and we're working off of D8 hit points. I just think that if you start doing D8 hit points, and then you've got like a 14 starting uh, constitution, and then we're working off monk armor class, which is moderate, right? Uh, that's just not a good combination. 
But we also really, really, really need a high dexterity and wisdom score. I would say that if you're going to start out with less than plus six total bonus between those two, you're in trouble because that's going to lower your armor class and then you are going to be defensively weak. Never mind the fact that those two ability scores tie into so many other things. So I actually think the best race for this particular character is going to be a half-elf. And what we can do is we can take the half-elf, we get three ability score increases, one of them is plus two. We are going to use our customizer origin, and then we're going to get the plus two in dexterity, and then the plus one in wisdom and constitution. We're also going to get dark vision, fate, ancestry, which gives us advantage against being charmed. And then we are going to take a half elf variant, and that is the one that is going to give us weapon training. And you can do this actually with several different kinds of half elf. I did the uh, high half elf, but you could be a different kind of half elf, and you likely can still get elf weapon training. I am going to keep the long sword and longbow that are standard, and then I'm going to add the warhammer, and I'm going to grab. Thieves Tools Proficiency. This character is going to have all kinds of tool proficiencies by the end. Of course, we are going Monk. I will be going Monk for 20 levels with this build. I have considered all kinds of multi-classes with Monk. And I think if we were going to go level 17 and then multi-class out of Monk at that point, there's some things we can do with it. But you know what? I'll take the extra key points frankly, and just stick with Monk right to level 20, even though they have a terrible capstone. But for the first 17 levels of Monk, when I look at different multi-classes, we're just giving up too much. I think if you're going to go Monk, it just doesn't multi-class all that well. We're better off just sticking with Monk. As I mentioned, hit points are a D8, but we'll live with it. Then we're going to get our proficiencies, so two skill proficiencies. I'm going to take Acrobatics and Stealth. Now, we're going to be going Mercy Monk, obviously, and we will be getting additional uh, proficiencies through Mercy Monk, but we're going to start out with these two, and then I grab Smith's tools. We're going to have all kinds of tool proficiencies. We already have Thieves tools. We're going to get a few more after that. Of course, as a monk, we don't wear armor. We rely on unarmored defense, which is going to give us 10 plus our dexterity modifier plus our wisdom modifier. Like I said, you don't want this to be below a 16 at level 1. And frankly, I think that when it comes to unarmored defense and the various things that tie to dexterity and wisdom, there are so many. I just don't think you can afford to not have your total bonus between those two ability scores start at plus six. And I think they have to be plus seven when you get to level four, plus eight when you get to level eight, plus nine when you get to level 12, and plus 10 when you get to level 16. And what you do with your level 19 ability score increase, whatever. But I do think that is absolutely a requirement with Monk because these ability scores are providing so many things for you. And you really create weaknesses for your character if you're not increasing one of them every level. Now, I've heard arguments to prioritize wisdom over dexterity. I think with a Mercy Monk, you are better to focus on your dexterity, although wisdom does play into some of our subclass features. It's just, you need to hit, right? You need to hit, and dexterity is what's going to give you your hit. And dexterity ultimately is going to add more damage than wisdom is. Wisdom actually adds damage too, but dexterity adds more. And, of course, initiative, right? We get a bonus to initiative with dexterity as well. Then at level 1, we're going to get martial arts. This is kind of the primary feature of a level 1 monk. We get our bonus action attack, which is an unarmed strike, does a d4 damage. I've been asked about taking the fighting initiate feat, and that will give you a d8 on your unarmed strikes. I actually think it is a terrible investment of a feat. I'm going to level up a couple times first, and then I can show you why. We're, of course, going to use our dexterity for our weapon attacks and our unarmed strikes. And we get our martial arts die, which starts at a d4, which is absolutely terrible, but it does scale of up to a d10 eventually. If you're using D&D Beyond, like I said, I'm counting on getting the monk optional class features, so I have them all checked off. And I know it's a bit cheesy to focus entirely on three stats, but with a monk, I really think you have to. 
you have to have a plus three dexterity, plus three constitution, plus three wisdom. Unless there's some magic way that you can get a plus four in one of these, then you could live it with a plus two in a different one. And so that really kind of makes us really focus. And I'm going to take a dexterity of 17. Like I said, we have to increase our dexterity or wisdom bonus every time we get an ability score increase. And at least with a 17 dexterity, I can take a half feat and still meet that criteria. As for the background, I've used Folk Hero uh, because the backstory fits it, but I have used the Player's Handbook base rules where we can modify our backgrounds so that I can start with Perception and Athletics. I'm also going to get two tool proficiencies, and I'm going to be taking Disguise Kit and Forgery Kit. So we have all kinds of tool proficiencies now, and we're even going to get more later on. Monks get very little starting equipment. At level one, I suggest take a quarterstaff or a spear. You're going to use it two-handed so you can take advantage of the versatile property. It'll give you a D8 damage plus dexterity. That's the best damage you're going to get at level one. So at level one, armor class 16, it's not a bad armor class, but it's not a super great armor class either. 11 hit points, that's not bad first level hit points, not great first level hit points. But for a monk, these two scores together are as good as we're going to get. We're going to be striking with our quarter staff, and that is going to give us a D8 plus 3 damage, and then we're going to do an unarmed strike for a D4 plus 3 damage. That ends up being 8.15 DPR at level 1, which isn't bad. The damage of a monk at level 1, even at level 4, no matter what kind of monk you're playing, is decent damage. It's once we get to level 5 when monk starts to fall behind, and then level 11, we really start to fall off a cliff. This character won't. Here is the DPR we can expect through all 20 levels. As you can see, the blue line is above the baseline I normally use. There's a link in the video description if you wonder what baseline means. And as we can see, the Mercy Monk is going to beat baseline for all 20 levels. Now, this isn't a ton of damage. We're doing decent damage all the way through. So we want something more than damage. And that's a large part of the reason we're going to take Mercy Monk is because Mercy Monk also debuffs enemies. Now, any monk, of course, can use Stunning Strike. Stunning Strike is not reliable, but it is okay. I mean, I don't hate Stunning Strike. Uh, you know, I push back against Stunning Strike when people say Stunning Strike makes a monk fantastic. I don't think a Stunning Strike makes a monk fantastic. It gives it one reasonably useful thing it can do that doesn't scale with your level. We can use it more times, but it never gets better. And it uses the exact same resource that everything else we're doing is using as well. So it just is difficult to afford that key to keep doing it as well. But with Mercy Monk, with Hands of Harm, we're delivering the poison condition at level 6. And that's in addition to our Flurry of Blows with no additional key expenditure. And unlike Stunning Strike, there's no save against it. We'll get into this more when we get to those levels. So at level 2, we add Dedicated Weapon. This is going to allow us to use a martial weapon that doesn't have the uh, heavy or special properties and that we're proficient in. So we are proficient in Warhammer and Long Swords, and we can pick one of them and use it as a monk weapon. Uh, for this character, I'm going to assume the Long Sword, but in terms of damage, they're equivalent. Why do I bother with both of them as proficiencies? Well, because magic weapons happen in D&D. And sometimes we just get a magic weapon that's in the adventure, and it's not the DM tailoring it to our character. So maybe we get a magic warhammer, and then this character can switch to the warhammer and take advantage of that magic weapon. At second level, we get our key. Key fuels everything a monk can do, uh, which I think is really painful, but that's the way it is. We will have a number of key points equal to our level, and we will recover them on a short rest. So the more short rests we can get, the better, because key goes very fast. At second level, we have three options for it already. We can do flurry of blows. When we take the attack action, we spend a key point, and we can make two unarmed strikes as a bonus action. Remember that with martial arts, we were already making an unarmed strike with our bonus action, so we're Flurry of Blows is actually only adding one additional attack. Then we have Patient Defense. We spend one key point and take the dodge action as a bonus action on our turn. So note that we can't combine Patient Defense and Flurry of Blows because they're both bonus action. And they both mean that we can't take our Martial Arts attack. 
So we're really making two expenditures to use patient defense, both the key and we're giving up an attack. That said, dodge can be very effective and it is something we will probably want to do some of the time. Probably not how I'm going to spend all my key, but there will be moments where patient defense is important. Maybe we're close to going down and then that dodge is going to keep us up. Well, then I'm going to do it. Then we have step of the wind, and that's one key point to take disengage or dash as a bonus action on our turn. So same thing. And then our jump distance is doubled. Uh, this is probably the one I will use the least. That said, there will be moments where I need disengage or dash, and it is there when I need it. What I would normally expect to use key on at this point, probably flurry of blows. I'm probably spending both on flurry of blows, though I should mention Flurry of Blows isn't adding a lot to our DPR at this point. It's actually adding less than half a point to our DPR. But I do use pretty strict methods for calculating DPR. I assume lots of combats. I don't assume multiple short rests. Uh, so it might actually add more than that if you're having a more reasonable adventuring day. Worst case scenario, it's less than half a point. And we get an armored movement at level 2, so now we are moving with a speed of 40. So at level 2, you can see we're now equipping our longsword. If you're using D&D Beyond, you have to go into the longsword and click off that it's a dedicated weapon, or it's going to base it off your strength. But it is going to give us plus 5 to hit, D10 plus 3 damage, so that is an increase over the quarterstaff. And uh, we might as well equip a longbow as well. We're going to have to buy it. It's not going to come with starting equipment, nor is the longsword. We're not going to be a great archer, but at least we have a good dexterity, so we will have at least something we can do at range. Now, you can make a monk that is really focused on ranged attack. So you could go Kensai Monk, I've seen this before, and you do a hand crossbow, you grab crossbow expert and sharpshooter. You're going to use sharpen the blade to pick up your crossbow's damage, and what you'll find is that that Kensai Monk can't do the things that monks normally do, like stunning strikes, and does less damage than you would do with a fighter. But they can move faster, I guess. The other problem is, of course, sharpen the blade assumes you're not going to have any magic weapons, and so the damage calculations often end up being misleading with it. So it often is a bigger gap between the monk and the fighter than you would have thought, because, you know, you happen to find a magic weapon. Or maybe there's an artificer in your party. We can give you a repeating hand crossbow. Well, you can't use sharpen the blade on that. So I really do think this is the best build we can do for a monk. At level 3, we're going to get key fueled attack. This means if we spend one key point or more as part of our action on our turn, we can make one attack with an unarmed strike or monk weapon as a bonus action before the end of the turn. Now, we can already do an unarmed strike when we do a attack action. But what this means is if we spend one key point on anything for our action, then we can use our longsword to attack with the bonus action. And remember, our longsword does more damage, D10 plus 3. Obviously, going Way of Mercy. This is my favorite monk, uh, and this is the monk I would play. Before Way of Mercy, I just didn't play monks because the mechanics were so bad. I saw monks played. I did play one for a couple sessions in a campaign, and it was a disaster, of course, but I've also watched other people play monks, and it's always a disaster. In a non-optimized game, I think they can do fine, but in an optimized game, they ultimately fall apart. But Way of Mercy, we can build so it can contribute in an optimized campaign. We get Deflect Missiles. This gives us a reaction if we're attacked with a missile attack, and we can reduce the damage by a D10 plus our Dexterity modifier plus our monk level. So just keep in mind, this does scale quite a bit. When we get to high levels, we can get shot with a sharpshooter hit, and we can reduce that damage to zero. Now, this gives us another option that we can use a key point and then throw the piece of ammunition. I generally don't think that's worth your key. I think that, you know, save your key and use it for really good stuff. This is just one ranged attack, monk weapon damage. It's basically like Flurry of Blows, I guess, but we're going to be getting more with Flurry of Blows as we level up and we don't get more with the Fleck Missiles. Then we're going to get Implements of Mercy. We're going to get Proficiency in Insight and Medicine. These are both based on Wisdom. Our Wisdom is good. And we're going to get Proficiency with a Herbalism Kit, because we want Proficiency in all tools, I guess. And we get a special mask, which is nothing. It is nothing at all. But for us, we're going to take our big wicker hat. Because it covers our face, I think 
we can call that a mask. Then we're going to get Hand of Healing and Hand of Harm. And I don't know why, but I always want to call them Hands of Healing and Hands of Harm. Uh, so if I do that later in this video, I know it's Hand of Healing, Hand of Harm. With Hand of Healing, we can, as an action, spend a key point to touch a creature and restore a number of hit points equal to a roll of our Martial Arts die plus our Wisdom modifier. And if we use Flurry of Blows, we can replace one of the unarmed strikes with the use of this feature without spending a key point for the healing. So there's just no reason why, in combat, we wouldn't do it that way. Using our action, I mean, we could technically use our action, spend a key point, and therefore we could attack once with our longsword as a bonus action, or we could attack once with our longsword as an action, and get an unarmed strike, and use a hand of healing by doing Flurry of Blows. So that's just our better option. Outside of combat, I guess, then you might as well just use your action. And then we get Hand of Harm. So what we do is whenever we hit a creature with an unarmed strike, we can spend one key point and we do extra damage. It's necrotic, which is going to be reliable damage. You do extra damage equal to your martial arts die plus your wisdom modifier. So at this point, that's five and a half on average. And what we want to do now is we want to stop doing flurry of blows and we want to start using all three of our key points on normally hands of harm, hands of healing when we need it but Hands of Harm will be our standard method of adding damage. Reason is, is it's just going to do more damage than Flurry of Blows. A hit with Flurry of Blows does about the same amount of damage as Hands of Harm does, except Hands of Harm doesn't miss. And over a combat day, we are going to hit three times with unarmed strikes, and when we do, we add Hands of Harm, and the damage is automatic. This will end up adding a huge amount of damage to our monk and it is largely the reason why we're going to stay over the baseline so hands of harm pretty good at level three it's going to get crazy good later but right now it's a decent feature at level four we get an ability score improvement and we are going to take a feat and like i said we want either our dexterity modifier or our wisdom modifier to increase every time we get an ability score improvement until they're both 20. That means most of the time, I'm just going to be taking the ability score improvement. But I did take a 17 dexterity to start, so I can get away with a half feat as long as the half feat adds to dexterity. There are three feats I would consider. The first is Slasher, which could increase our dexterity. And then we can reduce target movement when we hit them. And when we score a critical hit that deals slashing damage to the creature, then it has disadvantage on all attack rolls. I think that's a pretty good way to go. Second possibility is Fey Touched Wisdom. Now, if I was to go this way, I would have gone with a 17 starting Wisdom score, of course. So obviously I'm not going this way. But if I did, I think it's okay. We get the Misty Step spell, which actually is a little bit of a conflict. And it's the main reason why I didn't go this way is because with Misty Step, what happens is it uses up your bonus action. And as a monk... What happens is we need our bonus action every single round. And like I said, whenever we do something that requires a bonus action, we're giving something else up. So I actually think a monk gets a little bit less than this than other classes do. But it would be nice to, you know, grab the bless spell or something, even if we could only cast it once per day. So I don't think this is a bad way to go, but I don't think it's our best option. The final option is to go Elven Accuracy. Because we are a half-elf, we do qualify. We can increase our Dexterity score, and whenever we make an attack with advantage, we can roll three dice. Now, this character doesn't have any built-in ways to grant advantage. It's just not built for that. But that doesn't mean we're never attacking with advantage. So advantage is just going to happen to a martial character, whether you build for it or not. And Elven Accuracy would increase our damage. It's hard to calculate that in DPR because you don't know when that advantage is going to occur, but it would objectively increase our damage. And Elven Accuracy is the way I'm going to go. Like I said, not factored into my DPR calculations at all because there's no real way to do that. And I was really considering, do I want Slasher or do I want Elven Accuracy? But the thing about Elven Accuracy is I can still use a Warhammer. We're fourth level. Magic weapons are coming up pretty soon here. What if we get a Magic Warhammer? How am I going to feel about having Slasher, right? Or if I took Crusher, how would I feel if a Magic Longsword came up? With Elven Accuracy, I can use it with anything. So it's just more flexible, and that's why I'm going that way. And then at fourth level, Slow Fall, so we can reduce falling damage. And it uses our reaction, and it's five times our Monk level. Eventually, we can fall from any 
distance and take zero damage. The most damage you can take from a fall is 20d6. That's 70 points of damage. Level 14, we can reduce our damage by 70. And I should mention quick and healing. I mean, technically speaking, if you're a monk who is not a mercy monk, then you might do this before a short rest if you have extra key left over, which you almost never do. But in the case of mercy monk, this is just a terrible option. We're just way, way better off using our hands of healing if we ever need healing. So this isn't a feature that we will never, ever use under really any circumstance. So at level four, now our dexterity bonus and our wisdom bonus add up to plus seven. That means we're going to have a 17 armor class. That's very, very needed. Then our initiative went up to a plus four. And our longsword and unarmed strikes are plus six to hit with a plus four to the damage. At level five, we are now going to get our extra attack feature. So we're attacking with our longsword twice on our turn. We also get focused aim. When we miss with an attack roll, we can spend one to three key points to increase our attack roll by two for each of these key points we spend, potentially turning them miss into a hit. Now, I will mention that, of course, we're starved for key, right? So it is tough to be spending, especially more than one key point on this. But on the other hand, that is significant. I mean, if you miss with an attack, you do no damage. So you can spend one key, and if you already know you missed by two or less, then you can get that, and then you're automatically getting that damage. And like with Hands of Harm, the nice thing is, is that you know what it's going to do. Now, if I don't know what the armor class of the enemy is, and the DM announces I miss, I'm never going to use Focus Dame. But if I know that if I could have just got one or two higher... I would have hit, then I think it is worth the key point. And I will say that very soon, even more so, if we're using an unarmed strike, it might even be worth two key points to make sure you hit. And then we get Stunning Strike. Uh, I think everybody knows about Stunning Strike. Whenever we hit a creature with a weapon attack, that includes our unarmed strikes, we can spend one key point to attempt a Stunning Strike, and the target makes a constitution saving throw, or they're stunned until the end of our next turn. Now, I've done a lot of pushback against Stunning Strike because people tell me that Stunning Strike is amazing, fantastic, makes the monk a good class. Fact is, I think Stunning Strike is okay. It's an okay ability. It's about as good as a first level spell, and I like spells, so that makes it a decent ability. It uses our key. Our key is so, so sparse, and it's not particularly reliable. I would say most of the time when you use Stunning Strike, don't expect it to work. But... If you stun a creature for a round, that can be very effective. Now, will I be using Stunning Strike a lot with this character? I'll be using it some of the time. I'm going to be getting into that pretty soon. Unarmed Fighting, and this is a new fighting style that came out in Tasha's, and I get asked all the time if maybe a monk should take this feat. And if you were a variant human, you could take it at level 1. So let me explain why doing this, I think, is a really bad idea. If we don't bother, like let's say we just don't get the feet, so we're saving a feat. From levels 2 to 4, we're looking at, you know, we're doing a long sword attack uh, for an average of 8.5 damage. Then we're doing an unarmed strike for an average of 5.5 points of damage. And once we take into account chance to hit, chance to crit, we're averaging about 8.8 .8 damage per round. That's just kind of the base damage. Now, let's say we expend a feat. So we expend a full feat to get the Fighting Initiate Unarmed Fighting Style. Now we're using a D8 for damage, so we're going to have 4.5 base damage plus our Dexterity. So we're doing 7.5 damage per attack, twice per round. Uh, so once we take into account chance to hit and chance to crit, we do about 9.45 points of damage per round. Now, you'll notice that those numbers aren't very different. In fact, they're less than one apart. So we're expending a full feat. We're not even getting one point of damage. But it gets worse. Because when we get to level 5, now, when we're using the longsword, we're still doing 5.5 points of damage. Uh, I'm assuming our dex is now plus 4, as it will be. And then with our unarmed strike, we're doing a d6. So now it's 3.5 points plus 4. So the longsword's doing nine and a half, and we're doing that twice per round, and we're doing the unarmed strike for 7.5.
Now our total damage, 16.63. Getting the feet, so we have expended the feet, we're now doing 4.5 plus 4 for 8.5 times 3, 15.98. You'll notice that number is now smaller. And the thing is, is it's worse than this because what happens is at some point a magic weapon's going to come up and then it gets even worse. So what ends up happening is because you took the feet, you're actually doing less damage than if you just hadn't bothered taking that feet in the first place. So that is what I would consider a terrible investment for a feet. Now we can change it, right? So let's say we get to level four, we're getting that, you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 points of damage per round. So very, very tiny increase to damage per round. And then we could switch our fighting initiate for another fighting style. But then we've got this feat that wasn't really our first choice, right? We took it to get this unarmed fighting style. We got nearly nothing out of it. And then we end up having to give it up, right? Because at this point, it's actually doing less than nothing for us. So people ask me, you know, does taking fighting initiate with the unarmed fighting style make the monk work? No, it doesn't make it work at all. What makes the monk work is Mercy Monk. But fighting initiate, unarmed fighting style, I think it's a bad investment. And I think if you do the math, it's really, really clear. Now, if you want to play a variant human, please do. I mean, there's no problem with it. I would just go with a different feat. But at level 5, we get a significant damage increase, right? We're doing more hands of harm because we have more key points. And we uh, have our long sword attacks, which we're now doing twice for a d10 plus 4 each. And our unarmed strike scaled as well. Level 6 is a huge level for the Mercy Monk. The level 6 subclass features are the reason I think Way of Mercy is the best monk. So first off, we get Key Empowered Strikes. Our Unarmed Strikes count as magical. Our movement speed goes up another 5 feet. And our Hand of Healing and Hand of Harm both got better. Our Hand of Healing now removes conditions, blinded, deafened, paralyzed, poisoned, or stunned, in addition to doing the healing. Now, stunned doesn't happen a lot, but I will say there are not a lot of ways to remove it. But the big thing here is our hand of harm just became really, really good because what we can do is when we hit a creature with our hand of harm, we automatically inflict the poison condition on it. And that lasts till the end of our next turn. And so at this point, stunning strike compared to this, if the creature can be poisoned, is a no contest, right? Because not only does it inflict damage, but it also inflicts a condition that automatically works. Now, poisoned isn't as good as stunned, right? I'd much rather have an enemy stunned than poisoned. It's not even close, but poisoned is still pretty debilitating. We're talking about disadvantage on all attacks. So if the enemy attacks, which let's face it, most enemies do, it is huge. And there is no con save it automatically works. Or I should say, it automatically works unless the creature is immune to being poisoned. And there are a lot of creatures immune to being poisoned. Undead are all immune to being poisoned. Fiends are immune to poison. Green dragons, of course. And there's other creatures as well. Though there are more creatures not immune to poison than there are immune to poison. This whole argument sometimes gets overblown where people say, well, Poison's useless because everything's immune. Well, no, no. There are lots of creatures, even at high level, that aren't immune to poison. So I would expect in most combats, we can use our hands of harm and inflict the poison condition. But what I will say is if we are fighting undead or fiends or something we know is immune to poison, that's when I would consider maybe using those stunning strikes because we do have that as an option. So we aren't tied down to just inflicting the poison condition. Inflicting the poison condition is the best thing we can do, but stunning strike is the second best thing we can do. So we can simply do that instead when we need to. At level seven, we're gonna get a couple more things. We're going to get evasion, which is great. I mean, if we're going to be making a dexterity saving throw, against things like fireballs or a lot of dragon's breaths. Uh, these things happen, right? And any dexterity saving throw where you would take half damage if you made your save, instead we're going to take half damage if we fail our save, and we'll take no damage if we make our save. And our dexterity save is good. It's our best saving throw. So I would expect that often we're not going to take any damage from these effects. And considering our hit points, I think that is really, really good to have. And we get Stillness of Mind, 
This allows us to use our action to end a Charmed or Frightened condition, assuming that Charmed and Frightened condition is letting you use your action freely. If somebody has done a Dominate Person on you, they're not going to let you use your action to remove the Charm condition. Still, I mean, you know, we're taking on a dragon and we fail against its frightful presence. Well, we can use an action to get rid of that. I mean, we lose our action, which still sucks. I don't love this ability, I gotta say. At level 8, we get our next ability score increase. And, you know, at this point, it's worth just being boring. And we'll just get our dexterity up to 20. Again, now we are at the point where we just want to go all out. So we're going to increase our dexterity to 20 right now. And now we're going to start on our Wisdom. Why? It's the Armor class. We want to get that Armor class up. We need as much defense with a Monk as we can get. And this is the way to do it. We're just going to increase our Dexterity, we're going to increase our Wisdom, and our Armor class will go up. Our Armor class is never going to be fantastic. But we don't want it falling behind, right? Because every time we get hit, we have to note the fact that we don't have as many hit points as most melee characters and soon we're going to be close to going down. Now we can use our Hands of Healing to heal some of that damage, but then we're inflicting less damage. And it's going to eat up our key. Level 9, we gain the ability to move along vertical surfaces and across liquids on your turn without falling during your move. This does not mean you have water walking. Okay, I've heard that before. But the fact is, is you go running into the water and you will remain on top of the water for your turn. And at the end of your turn, down you go. So we can cross water on our turn, but we can't stand on water at the end of our turn. Same thing with the walls. Still, this does improve our mobility, and increases to mobility are good if you have something you can do with it. And this character does. At level 10, now we're going to get Purity of Body. This is going to give us immunity to disease and poison. Disease doesn't come up a lot. Poison does, and immunity to poison, great. And our movement speed increases by 5 more, so now we have a base movement speed of 50. Then we get to level 11, which is a big level. We get another really good subclass feature. First thing, if we use Flurry of Blows, we can replace each of the unarmed strikes with the use of our Hand of Healing without spending key points for the healing. So we can heal twice when we use Flurry of Blows. And our Martial Arts die now has scaled to a D8, so that Hand of Healing is doing D8 plus 3. So it's like being able to do two first level Cure Wounds and two second level Lesser Restorations with your bonus action. And the other thing is, if we use Flurry of Blows, we can now use Hands of Harm without using Key for the Hands of Harm. So Flurry of Blows now has Hands of Harm as an option just built in. It's limited to once per turn regardless, but... Now what we want to do is we want a Flurry of Blows with all 11 of our key points. Again, if we're facing something immune to poison, maybe do some stunning strikes. But for most combats, I'd be using all my key on Flurry of Blows. Because we just can either combine it with Hands of Healing, or we can combine it with Hands of Harm. And other than the cost of the Flurry of Blows, these add-ons are just free. So offensively, this character does just fine. We're doing over baseline damage, and monks at a level 11 often struggle to meet the baseline. So we're exceeding it, but in addition to exceeding it, we're delivering that poison condition probably every round if creatures aren't immune. At level 12, really, I think your best bet, be boring, increase your wisdom. Because by increasing our wisdom by 2, what just happened? Well... Our Hands of Harm damage went up, our Hands of Healing healing went up, our Armor class went up, and our Saving Throws went up. Never mind the fact that we have a ton of skills that are based on Wisdom. And there's no feat we can pick that's going to give us that many things. Level 13, what we're going to be getting is, this is basically a permanent Tongue spell. Which is fine. I mean, Tongues is a third level spell. So at 13th level, not necessarily a big deal. And this is utility only, of course. Then we go to 14th level, we get two things. One of them is very big, and that is Diamond Soul, which is going to give us proficiency in all saving throws. And if we make a saving throw and we fail on the check, we can spend a key point to re-roll it. And whether you do that or not really depends on what the saving throw is against. But proficiency in all saving throws is a big deal. Like I have said many times, this comes really late. 
14th level already, right? We've gone 13 levels without this. But at this point, we now have some good saving throws. And our movement speed has gone up another 5. And I should say not all our saving throws are great. Strength, Intelligence, Charisma are all plus 4. But at least plus 4, that's not bad, right? And our Dexterity, Wisdom, and Constitution saves are all good. And those are the three saves that come up the most in this game. And we're now sitting on a 19 armor class. Presumably we're going to have some magic items to boost that some more. So our armor class is keeping up to being reasonably good. Uh, it's not a great armor class, but it is probably good enough that we're not super easy to hit. And this is because we've been focusing on it. At level 15, we technically get a feature, uh, which is Timeless Body. So we don't suffer the frailty of old age, and we can't be aged magically, though we can still die of old age, and we no longer need food or water. This is all mostly flavor stuff. It's what we call a ribbon ability, where it's more about the themes than actual mechanical benefits. I mean, if I could have Timeless Body in real life, sign me up. But uh, in D&D, not a big deal. Level 16, we're going to get another ability score increase, and we get our wisdom up to 20. So now we are healing the maximum amount possible with Hands of Healing. We are doing as the maximum amount of damage possible with Hands of Harm. And our armor class is as high as we're going to be able to get it, which is a 20. Again, I would expect higher than 20 because of magic items. At 17th level, now what weapon we use doesn't matter. We do the same damage with a dagger that we do with our longsword. So if the best magic weapon that's available as a dagger, go for it. There's no reason not to do that. It's also useless now to use the versatile property because our longsword does as much damage one-handed as two-handed. Everything's a d10 now. So what this does do is it does give us the ultimate freedom in what weapon we use or whether we use a weapon at all. Though, frankly, I still think we don't have that freedom because we're going to have magic weapons and that does make a significant difference. We get our final subclass feature, which is Hand of Ultimate Mercy, and basically it's a raised dead. Though it is better than a raised dead uh, because it is an action, so it's more like a revivify, except no material component, they heal more damage, and they lose some conditions. This costs us five key points. Frankly, your party likely has had methods to bring back dead PCs for 12 levels now. So although this is a decent way to do it, it's just probably not all that big a deal. It's not going to be dramatic. And frankly, if you wanted to multi-class your monk, this would be the point. You could take, you know, three levels of cleric, and you could potentially do something with that. I think we're 17 levels in monk. Let's get the three additional key points. Now, I will say that when we got to level 16, I would assume, even on a brutal adventuring day, that we can use a key point every single turn of combat in order to do Hands of Harm or Hands of Healing. So we're not spending all our key points on Hands of Harm anymore. So what do we do with those key points? Well, perhaps we turn a miss into a hit. Perhaps we attempt a stunning strike. Uh, now we can actually do that without actually sacrificing damage. Uh, and it really depends. Now, if we're just turning misses into hits, actually our DPR increases, uh, which I'm not showing on my DPR list because I'm not certain that's the way we would spend it, but we might spend it that way. Uh, personally, I would probably be doing that some of the time anyways, and if I have key left over, yeah, I'd definitely try to Stunning Strike. And just to go very quickly over what happens up to level 20, there's not a lot that happens anymore. We get Emptied Body at level 18, allows us to turn invisible for four key points. My big problem with this actually isn't the key expenditure anymore, because we're 18th level, we have a lot of key now, we can do our Hands of Harm pretty much with Abandon, so spending four key to turn invisible wouldn't necessarily be a killer investment. The problem with this is, it lasts for one minute and it uses an action, so unless we have the ability to prep before a combat, I don't think this is worth it, right? Uh, even though it's essentially improved invisibility, which is nice, but I just don't think it's worth our action to set this up. Though I will say, if you do spend your action to set this up, then 
at least you can use your key fueled strikes and get a single attack with your bonus action. And we can cast Astral Projection, which is a ninth level spell, but you know what? It is also a very, very circumstantial spell. Uh, but, you know, we have that option. Our movement speed, now 60 feet. That's as fast as we're going to get. Our capstone, by the way, is crappy. We have to run out of key and then roll initiative and then we get four key points. Now, I would expect most of the time that we're going to try to portion our key points so that that in fight of the day, which is probably the most important fight of the day, we still have more than four key points. And we get one final ability score improvement. Now, at this point, we have a dexterity of 20 and a wisdom of 20, which is great. So what do we want to do with our final ability score increase? Well, we could increase our constitution, and I don't think that's a terrible option. The fact is, is that monks don't necessarily have a whole lot of feats that support the kind of weapons they tend to use. Now, my standby feat when I'm not sure what to take is Lucky, and I really like Lucky because, of course, if you fail a saving throw, it's really handy to be able to re-roll it because sometimes those saving throws are so important. Or, you know, defensively, if something hits you and then you have it re-roll, especially if it rolls a critical, that can be really helpful as well. I do think Monk gets a little bit less from this because our saving throws are actually pretty good and we do have the ability to re-roll them already by spending a key point and we likely are at the level now where that's not a deal breaker. So I'm not sure Lucky is quite as good on this, though I do think it's a good choice. I personally think the best option here is to shore up a weakness and one thing that we've been struggling with all along is the fact that we have a little bit less hit points than most melee characters. So we could increase our constitution here and we would also get an increase to that saving throw. But you know what, our constitution saving throw is pretty good. We are proficient in it. So I actually think we're going to be best off with tough because tough is giving us two hit points per level. So twice as much as an increase to constitution would give us 40 extra hit points once we get to level 20. And for us, that's a bigger percentage increase than if you take tough on something like a fighter or a barbarian, right? Because they are starting out with more hit points. So two per level is a smaller percentage of increase. For us, it's a bigger percentage. So we're getting a little bit more out of it. So I think tough is really good here. And that's what I would probably go with. And that is Mercy Boku. This is the 20th level character. Damage here, you know, it's okay, right? We're not doing insane amounts of damage, but we're doing a heck of a lot more than most monks do. And in addition, most monks are trying and trying and trying to stun creatures and succeeding some of the time. Well, we are poisoning creatures and it works every time unless they're immune. And if they are immune, well, then we do the stunning. Add in the options for healing, for condition removal, and I just think that Mercy Monk ends up really kind of standing out amongst monks. Is this going to be the most powerful character you can make? Absolutely not. Is this the most powerful monk you can make? I think it's either the most powerful monk or darn close to it. I mean, if I miss something, let me know. But I think we made every decision right. And whether it is or not, I do think that this particular character following this particular build, could join an optimized party and you would not feel left behind. You're going to contribute. You're going to contribute in damage and you're going to contribute in debuffing enemies and significantly so. And frankly, your healing is going to come into play as well. So that is my best monk build. Merci beaucoup. Hope you enjoyed it. Otherwise, until next time, going to sit back, relax and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks everybody. Talk to you soon.